joining with us today again for another one of our daily devotions from the Tornado Apostolic Church. Today we're going to talk about the results of the fall of man. You see, for the first time since Adam and Eve were created, now because of the fall they realize their own nakedness and they flee for cover. And what happens is when this happens, this marks the end of what we call the dispensation of innocence and begins the dispensation of conscience. You see, also for the first time, we find also that mankind is now attempting to hide from God when before uh, Adam enjoyed being in the presence of the Lord. And we see this, the Adam nature for the natural man is now prone to hide their sin rather than seek God for deliverance. Adam does not call on God to solve his problem, but rather we find here in the Bible, in Genesis now, we find God seeking Adam. If we are saved, it is not because we sought the Lord, but it is because he sought us out. 1 John 4, 9 and Romans 5 and 8. The Bible teaches us that Jesus came to the world, not because sinners were seeking him, but because he came to seek and save that which was lost. God had a question for Adam. He asked him, he said, Adam, where art thou? The question was not so that God could discover Adam and the place where he was in the garden, but it was so that Adam could confess and Adam could consider his lost condition before God. It is the work of a minister to show a sinner where he stands before God. The word will be a lamp unto their feet. It will show them the dangerous ground that they are standing on. And no one will ever take the seat of a saint in heaven who does not first take the sinner's chair. He must first see that he is lost. This position, he will see that he, that he is the one Jesus came to seek and to save. The Adam nature is revealed again when Adam turns and he says to God, it's the wife that you gave me. And then Eve would blame the serpent. We've also find in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible talks about Adam and Eve sewing fig leaves together to cover their nakedness. And this covering is rejected by God because there is no covering made by man that will ever be able to satisfy God. You see, the Adam nature attempts to cover himself with good works and to cover up his sin rather than confessing their sin and forsaking their sin. The, ap the aprons of fig leaves are just man's attempt to justify what he has done wrong. And man's covering is described in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. The Bible says that all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Isaiah 31, God says some are covered with a covering, but not with his spirit. Our salvation is not based upon good works, lest any man should boast. God does reveal his plan and his mercy towards fallen mankind by giving him the promise of a redeemer. You see, in Genesis 3 and 15, we have the first promise of the Messiah to come. He tells Eve, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. And uh, it shall bruise thy head, the serpent, and thou shalt bruise his heel, the seed of a woman. And that seed would be Jesus because he was born of a virgin. And Satan would bruise his heel or stop Jesus from walking for about three days while in the tomb. But when Jesus Christ arose from the tomb, Christ bruised the head of the serpent and he was able to prevent, be able to buy mankind back from the bondage of Satan. In the 21st century, we find that the Lord made coats of skins, the 21st verse rather, we find that the Lord made coats of, skin, coats of skins and clothed Adam and Eve, and God made a covering of his own. In order to clothe them with skins, an animal had to be slain, and its blood would have to be shed. And this lamb, this animal, would lose its own life, even though it had done nothing wrong. And so this animal's blood would be shed for the sins of Adam and Eve, and then the seed of the woman, her, his blood would be shed for the sins of the world. It was an innocent animal that died to clothe Adam and Eve. So Jesus, who knew no sin, died in order to clothe the guilty sinners with a robe of righteousness, an acceptable covering of his spirit. 
the earth would be cursed and sorrow and childbearing is pronounced upon the woman. The ground would be cursed for man's sake and he must from that day forward earn his living by the sweat of his brow. Now man will have to struggle with thorns and thistles and all men will return to the dust from whence they came. The Lord then drove Adam and Eve out of the garden lest they should eat of the tree of life, the Bible would say, and live forever in their sinful state. The Lord also guarded Eden with a cherubim with a flaming sword which moved and turned every way to keep the tree of life. God plainly states his reason for driving out of the garden is to make sure that they do not eat the tree of life, for if they eat of that tree, they would live forever. It's contrary to God's plan to have eternal life outside of Christ. This account does not do away with the false teaching that a does, does do away with the false teaching that a sinner possesses eternal life. In 1 John 3 and 15, the Bible teaches us we are told. No murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Jesus in John 6 and 53 said, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Those who possess eternal life and those who do not are described in 1 John 5, 10 through 12. He that hath the Son hath life. The word means immortality. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16, we are told that God alone has immortality. <clears throat> Eternal life is a gift that comes from God. In Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And one of my pastors used to say, if the wages of sin are death, then quit before payday. Romans 2 and verse 7 says we are told that immortality is something we must seek for by patient continuance and well-doing. The sinner's soul cannot die is contradicted in Ezekiel 18 and 4 because the Bible says the soul that sinneth it shall die. Since the tree of life is guarded by the flaming sword, no one can partake of it without submitting to death from the sword. You see, Jesus was the first victim of the flaming sword. He tasted death for every man. Eternal life is in him. The veil of his flesh had to be rent before it was accessible to man. Jesus is now the tree of life. And through obedience to the word of God, which is a sharp sword, we die out to the world, the flesh and the devil. We must die out to the world to be the friend of the world. The Bible teaches us is to be the enemy of God. According to James 4 and 4. In Galatians 2 and 20, we must be crucified with Christ because if we are dead with him, we shall also live with him. What a contrast God has made in the garden as God made it and the sorrow and the trouble brought into the world through sin. This is the same difference between a heart yielded to God and one which persists in going its own way. The stubborn heart is filled with turmoil and chaos, but the blood-washed heart is overflowing with the peace of God, which passeth understanding. Let us pray today. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would go with us today. I ask, Lord, that if there's those who have never repented, never been baptized in Jesus' name, never been filled with the Holy Ghost, and they don't know the covering of the Spirit of the Lord that is upon their life and they can have, I pray today, God, before this day sets with the setting of the sun that they would find that place, seek you, repent, be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, God, and then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins and that they too can have the peace of God living in their heart. Thank you, Lord. I appreciate you and everything you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you for being with us. I pray that the rest of the day will be blessed in Jesus' name, and we'll see you tomorrow morning. God bless you.